I always look forward to talking to you, but then I'm like, oh no, he's gonna forget about me by the end of it. Why do you think that? I'm scared that every other date that you have is gonna go better than ours. Codependent people like Danielle don't believe that they are worthy of love for who they are. They value the opinion of others over their own. That's why someone like Danielle is constantly checking with Nick for what he thinks. I'm scared that you're gonna think that how I've been acting is how I'm gonna act for the rest of our lives. And it's not, it's not like that. I'm, I'm like really scared of you judging me. And in a relationship, that becomes really toxic because your sense of worth is dependent on someone else. And over time, your whole identity is wrapped up in that relationship and you can't imagine being anything outside of that relationship. And Danielle was constantly looking to Nick to soothe her, to tell her that the fears that she has about herself are incorrect. I want you to like know all my flaws. Like, I feel like that's the one thing where I talked to him. I was like, you I feel like he, I know, but I'm like, I feel like he doesn't like fully acknowledge them. What do you think are the things that are gonna turn me off or change the way that I feel? Because here we are and I'm still sure. And a dear friend of mine called Anna Runkle from the Crappy Childhood Fairy has a few words for Danielle. Don't try to make your partner talk and talk and talk to you about your fears. It's like 10 o'clock at night and it's like, honey, I just feel like you didn't really mean it when you said you love me tonight. The next thing you know, it's four in the morning. Everybody's crying. <laughs> it's gotten heavy and it's gone round and round. And I would say, you know what? When it's not going anywhere, that's because the issue isn't real. What we're doing is taking a fear we have. I have fear you don't love me. I have fear you're not going to be there for me. We're projecting it on the other person. And no matter what they say, no matter what they do, it doesn't fix the fear because it's a fear. It's not actually something they did to us. And don't think Nick is off the hook because it takes two to do the codependent tango. But we'll get to that in a minute. Hi, I'm your host in denial. Your host. <laughs> wow. I'm in denial so you can wake up. And if you're new to my channel, I call myself a drag therapist. And what I've been doing in the last few weeks is kind of reviewing or analyzing or reacting to uh, the latest season of Love is Blind. But what I'm gonna be doing now is taking a deep dive into older seasons and in a series called the Toxic Attachment Series where I analyze different codependent couples. Basically everyone on the show is codependent and they all need therapy. But this week we're dealing with Nick and Danielle. And no one is more codependent than Nick and Daniel. Actually, that was the first couple I thought of when I thought of this series because they are so, they're the epitome of codependence. And what is codependence? Codependence is basically a symptom of an insecure attachment where you feel that on your own, you have no value, that you're not worthy of anything, that you only matter within that relationship, that without that relationship, you don't even know who you are. It become, The relationship becomes basically the air that you breathe. You can't exist without it. And that kind of insecure attachment stems from childhood. It doesn't just pop up out of nowhere. And in the case of Nick and Danielle, they both, when they met in the pods, it was very clear what they were escaping from. There's been a long history of divorce in my family. There is no relationship that I've witnessed that has been successful. Am I going to be just following in the footsteps of everyone else in my family? Are your parents still together? No, they're not. They've been divorced since I was five. They're traumatized by childhoods that were plagued by divorce on both, on both ends and they just wanted to do something completely different. And how about in general, not just for Nick and Danielle, that all of us human beings stop focusing on what we don't want because what you don't want ends up becoming what's happening. The experiment is over for Love is Blind stars Danielle Rule and Nick Thompson. Because you are what you think about. You can tell yourself that this is what you're avoiding, but actually if all you think about is what you want to avoid, then that's all that takes up space and that's what will end up happening. For me, the most telling thing about uh, Nick and Danielle and the way, their, their f***ed up way of seeing marriage and relationships is how Danielle described marriage in After the Altar, where she said that marriage is basically what she thinks, what she likes about marriage is knowing that that person can never get away. And it's like, you don't have to think twice about the other person not being there because you're married, so. That's like one of the coolest things about it. And let's go back to this insecure attachment. Basically, insecure attachment has three types. There's the anxious attachment, which is Danielle to a T. Basically, it's you're just, you have this desperate fear that the person is gonna leave and you have the desperate craving for them to soothe you. And there's the avoidant attachment where basically you avoid people and or run away because you already have this inherent belief that no one is to be trusted. And there's the anxious avoidant type, which is Nick. Basically, he gets overwhelmed because Danielle is overwhelming. And then he runs away when he's emotionally dysregulated. And then when he calms down and when he's emotionally regulated, 
he basically he comes back to that craving that, that he wants to rescue her. If you can sum up how uh, Nick was behaving throughout the show, he was just uh, he just believed this identity that he was rescuing Danielle and that started already in the pods Like I've seen like so many relationships like something always has to happen So I'm like something's gonna like bad is gonna happen Why do I cry so easily? It's okay I'm emotional <laughs> It's okay I wish I could like hug you For me the moment that he, uh, Nick was hooked is when Danielle was on the other side describing her fears I was dating a guy who every time he was like laying next to me in bed He was scrolling through his phone and all I would see were these girls that were like you know, like, not me. Jeez. And so I, I would get so, like, in my head about that. And he was just scanning. You can imagine, you can see his imagination get fired up. Wow. But it was just like, yeah, because I'm, I'm like, I didn't even want to tell you that. Like, it's something that I'm constantly insecure about. And we were brittle from the start. He was just picturing a life with her that he's like, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can do this. Like she almost fit some piece of a puzzle in him. And that's the illusion. It's like, you have all the power to make me feel happy or sad. And no one can. That's just too much. It's, it's not just too much to ask. It's not even real. It's not even real. And I really believe that Nick is stuck in this role of the rescuer because actually people who, who are constantly obsessed with rescuing someone, why do you think that is? Because the person who needs rescuing is never gonna leave, is never gonna abandon you. So you know that's kind of, you take it for granted that that person is always going to need you. And then again, to go back to this, uh, what codependence is, is basically the relationship becomes your identity and his identity is wrapped up in just her losing her mind and having panic attacks and him jumping in to save her. Danielle would always just uh, get in her head and the fears and the anxiety would take over and then she would just start accusing him. And then suddenly she would start crying like, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this. And that's what always gets him when she kind of apologizes and she becomes very meek and like, oh, I need you. Please don't leave me. And but it was just so sick and twisted how their every fight was just her accusing and then just kind of in the same breath, just telling him that, oh, these are my fears taking over. It's, it's just this weird mix of passive aggression. Uh, and you, you, the way that you're looking at me right now, I can tell that you're like, you're, you are judging me for it. I'm not judging you for it. Yeah. I'm not judging you. I'm trying to understand and I'm trying to support. It's just like the way that you're responding to me makes me feel worse, like a lot worse. Trying to understand. I know. We don't know how to navigate each other in those situations yet. And that's what's like trying. a huge thing. I know you are. I know you are. I genuinely do trust you and I know that your intentions are always good. Yeah. <laughs> By his own admission, if you remember uh, Nick at the reunion, he called himself, I'm a fixer. That's what I do. And I know like one of my faults is I'm a fixer. So like when there's a problem, I'm like, okay, I go into fix mode. When he took her to meet his family, when she was like, oh, I'm a ball of anxiety. And he's like, yeah, she is. She gets pretty nervous. Yeah. About everything. Yeah. <laughs> Literally everything, yeah. I'm like a ball of anxiety. They were asking her all these questions and basically she was talking about how in her moment of, you know, panic, he came for her and he starts nodding. Like, he's so happy. Like, he is wrapped up in this role of saving her. He saw me have a really, really bad panic attack in Mexico. And so I was like, oh my gosh, like, is he going to change his mind? But the, the way that he was there for me, like, went above and beyond, like, anything that I could have wanted and made me feel 10 times better than, like, I ever have in a situation like that. He, like, loved me. And this pattern that, this codependent pattern that Nick and Daniel have, is like an addiction, even though it's not a substance, but they're, both of them are addicted to this relationship and what it gives them. Because if you notice anything that's addiction, like it soothes you in the moment, but then it hurts you and you keep going back. And that's exactly what happens with them. When I was so happy about how my family thought about you, I assumed that you would be as happy. And then the of second- Of course I was happy. Because in the moment I thought that you were being fake. Did you ever think the world doesn't revolve around like you? Oh, okay. I was happy for one fucking day. One day. And you're gonna be like, oh, the world revolves around you. Let's fuck up. I had things going on yesterday outside of your meeting your family, okay? Sorry, but like the way that you're talking to me right now, I can't. I... The thought of you being upset at all is terrible. The thought of me being the reason that you're upset is even worse. And so I was like <laughs> mad at myself too. Why do I always cry? <laughs> because I love you and like, 
the thought of me being the reason that you're not happy kills me. And you always make me feel 10 times better when I'm going through stuff. So to know that you go through stuff that I wasn't able to help you through, you know, that, that hurts me. And like, again, I understand that you don't communicate your emotions. Did you notice in that last fight how even the dog was like, mm -mm, I'm out, peace. Again, I understand that you don't communicate your emotions as much as I do, but I want you to, because I want to be there for you like you are me, you know? Because it means so much to me that you are there for me all the time. I will be the light that carries you. And that's the trouble with going to someone else to soothe you because it will never work. You have to learn how to soothe yourself. But Anna Runkle says it better than me. Now, this is where you hear this a lot in unhappy relationships. My needs aren't being met. Those are people who never got full and shiny and healed in themselves, not getting their needs met by somebody else, which somebody else couldn't have met. Can't solve the problem that you have a big wound from childhood. And speaking of childhood, that's where you learn insecure attachment. And not just because they both had parents who were divorced and they were traumatized by that and they wanted to avoid that. I think you learn insecure attachment from parents who are insecurely attached themselves. And if you notice in the many times that uh, Danielle's mother popped up in the series, she was constantly talking about, about Danielle's patterns and how she's a lot, or you're a lot to take, or you're just like me, you push people away. You're a lot. A lot to take. And that's from? not a bad thing. I am too. Uh, you're going to have to be strong because she tends to jeopardize her relationships. Oh, no, I, you, no, I know you. I know me. You're just like me. And that's exactly right. That's that's where she learned it from. And also not just that. She also, I think, learned the drinking because if you notice, the mom has a bit of a drinking problem. You guys want some champagne? Oh, gosh, twist my arm. <laughs> And for me, the one of the most red flaggy things Daniela has ever said is when she was like, oh, basically, I'm the, I'll drink uh, wine from the spit bucket at wine tastings. If you don't like anything, we will put a little dump bucket over here or if you're just feeling too tipsy and you're I will drink the dump bucket. <laughs> and another uh, reason why I believe she had insecure attachment from the time she was a child is because the theme of her being overweight when she was young always came up from the very beginning in the pod. I was a young girl actually, um, probably like sixth grade. And I was walking home from school one day and this guy that I really liked, I was flirting with him and I heard him turn around and be like, oh, this girl's fat. But now every single interaction that I have with someone, I'm so scared that they're gonna be like, oh, her arms look big here or her stomach looks big here. And I really think she grew up in a hypercritical environment of her appearance. And that's something her mom uh, talks about in this kind of weird passive aggressive way like oh i always thought that danielle's never gonna find someone to love her danielle has struggled with her looks and her weight and her insecurities and i wanted somebody to love her for who she is and not what she looks like and a little sidebar or actually i don't know if it's a sidebar because it fits right into this this addictive escapist behavior that's inherent in codependent relationships how both nick and danielle they're always trying to escape the how unhappy their relationship is and how you know mismatched they are for each other by focusing on other people and nick is always gossiping about uh, the other couples anna and jared i want the best for them and she was and I'm like she was gonna cut his throat if he actually told me. And Danielle has this very weird thing, like when she started crying um, about deep tea, supposedly when she was talking to Kyle. God, I need to go to the bathroom. Like this happens to me so emotional. Every time I talk about deep tea, I get emotional because she deserves so much. <laughs> deep tea is such a girl. What the fuck? <laughs> That's a lot of emotion for someone else, <laughs> and you're not crying about someone else. You're crying about yourself. In codependent relations, basically, you have four types of reactions. Fight, flight, fawn, and freeze. Fight is basically where you're just, what Daniel and Nick were always doing. Basically, like, I'm going to put you in your place. And flight is basically when you just, you know, I don't know what to do with you anymore, which is kind of a very passive aggressive way of fighting because you're really doing the same thing, but you're making it look like it's somebody else's fault. And, oh, I don't know what to do with you, but you're still there. And fawn, where you're just fawning over the other person. You're just appeasing them. You're just agreeing with everything they say, which is something Danielle does a lot. 
And freeze is when you basically, you just shut down and you don't want to deal. And uh, Danielle did that at the first time where all the couples met at the retreat and she just refused to go to the party and she was like vomiting over the bathroom like and eating her bread. She's under the weather. She got some sort of stomach bug, so it's unfortunate. I hate bread. I don't want to make me feel better. And then she made a whole big deal uh, and a big fight with their first fight actually, her and, and Nick, when he came back from the party where she said basically she's sick and she can't go and then she apparently she was just watching him from the balcony. I mean, I mean, it looks like you were having fun. Oh, I was talking to the girl about capitalism. Like, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> you saw that? Yes. I shut this and I sat in the closet and cried by myself. I told you I didn't for have hours. To go. Do you believe me? Do you trust me? I don't. I, I'm, I'm not kidding. I don't trust anything right now. I can't believe you don't trust me at all. I'm it's done. Hey. No, I'm done. I'm a little tired of hearing. No, but you're acting mad at me and you're being toxic and you gotta stop. Basically, in codependent relationships, you're constantly dancing around between these four type of reactions because you're just doing anything to regulate yourself emotionally because you're constantly like afraid and scared that the other person will leave and you're trying to, to do anything to regulate your feelings and soothe yourself. Because I think this childhood trauma that really starts all of this, it does change something in your brain, in your neurochemistry. And, and there's an incredible uh, psychiatrist called Dr. Bruce Perry. And what he says is basically that childhood trauma causes the underdevelopment or overdevelopment of neural pathways that affect our behavior in adult life. Dr. Perry wrote this book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. Wow, it's like 10 cases of severe childhood abuse and neglect and what that does. And my favorite story, well, favorite, it's just so haunting, called The Coldest Heart, about this young boy who's now in maximum security prison for being and murdering other two other teenage girls. And as horrific as what he did was, Dr. Bruce Perry goes back into his childhood and figures out that basically this boy was abandoned for days on end like in his crib crying until he figured out that the only way nobody's going to come to his rescue so he just stopped crying and ultimately stopped feeling that story is so chilling because you can't excuse what he did but also you have to understand that people do things because of things that happen to them on a lighter note <laughs> what really stood out for me from that family gathering where nick took daniel to meet his family and when the family were questioning her basically they're asking her like why are you two together and after she talks about how he helps her and saves her and rescues her basically she says something like oh i can't articulate what it is how like confident we are like it's just like it's nuts it's like i wish that i could articulate it girl that's the problem you need to be able to articulate it and i think anna Ranko has a couple of words to say about that yeah because i used to get that one all mixed up again and again and <laughs> that makes and i finally of learned <laughs> be yeah, that... clear and in conclusion, we need to do a couple of things. First, recognize the childhood wounds that lead to all this and the fact that our parents actually didn't know any better. Number two, recognize that the codependence is basically serving as a coping mechanism. It has a function. Number three, after you've recognized that function and you know what it's serving, what it's doing in your life, you need to find healthy alternatives for you know, how to get that. And number four, you need to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness of the triggers that come up. Basically, the triggers that push you into relationships like that and also to realize that you, you don't need to rely on someone else. You can soothe yourself. You're no longer that helpless child. And number five, you need to like and comment and subscribe to this channel. And finally, it takes a lot of patience, doesn't it? Because part of you really wants to be in a relationship. But what you don't want to do is the same old thing where you just take whatever is available because it's better than nothing. No relationship is not nothing at all. It's freedom. It's joy. It's fun. It's closer to true love than you've ever been. Because when you're in a bad relationship, you're a million miles away from true love. The intermediary step from a bad relationship to the love of your life is being single. And when you're willing to say no to the guy who does not match what you know you need, you know you need it. Why would you sell yourself short? Then all your emotional energy, all your, all your sexuality just gets all tied up and it's not available to just shine outward. So you're just letting yourself shine. Don't think of it as nothing. Don't think of it as waiting. Think of it as shining. 
I, I know you, you're, you're a very secure person. I think you have a lot of self affinity. You love yourself. You're able to do this. You're not desperate. 